Hi, my name is Miranda Heights and I'm a graduate student at West Virginia University in the Master of Public Administration and Graduate Certificate in Cultural Resource Management. I'm here to share with you today about life in the time of COVID, the impact on West Virginia's museums and historic sites. This grant funded research project was provided through the West Virginia University Humanities Center Collaborative Grant, in addition to having support from the West Virginia Association of Museums. My research has been conducted alongside Dr. Jennifer Thornton, Assistant Professor in History here at WVU. So I'm going to begin by sharing with you our strategy and approach for collecting data first, and then I'll talk to you about our research findings that we have had thus far. So first, it's a good idea to know how we did this project. It began in early June 2020, and we are proceeding until May 2021. The research is funded, again, as I stated, by the Humanities Center here at WVU, and our objective and purpose of this study is to examine what impact COVID-19 has had on cultural institutions, specifically those which are small and rural in the state of West Virginia. The research method for this project has been interviews to survey professionals from cultural institutions, typically executive directors, to assess what impact COVID has had on them and the effectiveness of various support initiatives received or conversely not received. We have been able to interview 27 cultural institutions or represent representatives of them in 18 different West Virginia counties over the course of this study, which has been able to uh, give us a great image of what the impact looks like here in West Virginia. So as far as our research findings go, these are the map of institutions who have participated. As you can see on right, you have uh, the counties broken down and the locations are shown in the map on the left. So we have some definite areas where we would like to have been able to speak to more, but we are still working on the project until May, so stay tuned. Uh, we've been trying to focus on areas of the state which maybe don't receive as much help or attention from the wider populace. And so that's enabled us to get a really broad look into what impact it has had on different types of institutions. So some of the institutional types that have participated are shown in the chart at left. So we've have we've had art centers, foundations, historical societies, mixed use facilities, museums, nonprofits, regional cultural centers, and a state park. Two of our institutions interviewed actually served as grantors themselves, providing needed support to different cultural institutions or cultural professionals across the state of West Virginia. The staffing and volunteering for these institutions is extremely important to what type of an experience they have had. So 48% of our institutions, uh, the majority, were staff-based. However, 41% relied on a combination of volunteers and staff to accomplish the needs of the institution. 11% were exclusively volunteer-based, and we found some really interesting uh, information about those institutions. Four is the number of average employees for these institutions who participated and who have paid staff that they rely on. And the major form of funding received by these institutions was donation, which was 44% of our recipients. However, there is a vast variety of different institutional types from endowments, revenue, and admissions. We did notice that those funding sources have a great impact on those different um, experiences since the pandemic has begun. Institutions who are affiliated with universities are more likely to feel stable and well supported because they tend to rely on more stable funding sources like endowments. Concerns of job security were limited among these groups as well. Some did, however, feel forgotten or disregarded and feared the future of their funding because their institutions, these universities, tended to be a bit more focused on the experiences of students and ensuring that they had the best possible experience. Institutions that are affiliated with state and federal funding sources, on the other hand, experienced higher levels of discretion and autonomy and needed received minimal guidance or assistance. However, this produced two diverging mindsets, one in which individuals felt grateful for the ability to make decisions without being you know, uh, looked over, whereas the others felt unsupported and abandoned by their state and federal funding sources and felt that they would have appreciated more direction. Independent and unaffiliated institutions, on the other hand, were most concerned with find, uh, their future and survivability. They were concerned with paying for utilities and salaries, most of all. These institutions tended to be more successful with larger support bases, and they did experience a fear of letting down the public or the predecessors who often worked unpaid to ensure that these institutions were able to make it into the future. The mentality of rural communities has weighted heavily on these institutions who sort of take on the approach that they've never really received a lot of attention and why would they now? It's a very sad mindset that's been produced. Unfortunately, it's been found commonly throughout these independent and unaffiliated institutions. 
In terms of engagement with community and partnerships, 59% maintain one or more community partnerships, which we define as any sort of affiliation with a municipality or an institution that does not necessarily rely on joint funding. Unfortunately, 25% did report that they received low levels of real or perceived support from their community, which is just to say that they felt that they were maybe not the community's number one priority during the pandemic, or they felt that their community simply didn't care whether or not the institution existed or not. 19% of these institutions are university or college affiliated. They again had better experiences over the pandemic in general than unaffiliated institutions and their counterparts who were state funded. In terms of engagement in volunteers, 14 of 27 institutions relied on volunteers for all or some operations. The safety of volunteers was a shared concern provided that many or most were over the age of 60 and some were even as uh, in the ages of the 80s and 90s. And that puts them into a higher risk category for contracting COVID-19, which has definitely led to a reduction in volunteerism for these cultural institutions over the course of the pandemic. Volunteer institutions reported lower levels of support, again, real or perceived, and they were more likely to experience those concerns for survivability that we've already discussed. Simply, this comes from the fact that they are focused on trying to fund their own lives and take care of things and doing unpaid work is very difficult in that context. So there were a number of stopgap funding measures that were made available or emergency funding measures made available to cultural institutions due to COVID-19. Some selected examples of these are hyperlinked here, which include the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, CARES Act, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a component of the CARES Act that's sort of taken its own form. The Institution of Museum and Library Sciences CARES Act grants are also available. And for additional guidance, the American Alliance of Museums has provided a number of resources available to institutions seeking emergency funding. In total, 45% of the institutions that we interviewed were able to access some form of emergency or stopgap funding. 14% were able to receive funding from both, which is a, a decent number. Unfortunately, there were a number of institutions that were not able to access this funding and did in fact, you know, struggle because of it. We were, however, able to see 25% receive the PPP loan, 14% receive both as stated, and 33% receiving CARES Act funding. So nevertheless, there were a number of funding opportunities accessible. Um, it was still a struggle. The West Virginia Humanities Center, uh, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, was able to supply $420,000 in funding as well to different cultural institutions in the state. And without that funding, some institutions may not have faced the same rate, rate of survivability as they were able to. So in terms of pay, furloughs, and layoffs, 7% of employees unfortunately reported that either they or another did not receive pay for all of the all or part of the pandemic, despite that they were not officially furloughed or laid off. What this means is that the individuals looked at their institution and realized that the institution might suffer or struggle if they did not defer their payment. This is a really difficult decision for someone to have to make, and it's very sad that many institutional members had to be put into that position. Nevertheless, 19% were also furloughed or officially laid off um, in one or more institutions. Unaffiliated institutions are generally more likely to furlough or lay off their employees than institutions who are affiliated with state, federal, or academic institutions. But nearly all pauses in pay were with concern for financial solvency in the future, or conversely, financial insolvency. In terms of visitation, temporary closures, and compliance, 99% of visitor-based institutions reported lower rates of visitation as compared to previous years, unless they had an outdoor component, in which case they experienced very little shape, uh, change. 100% were forced to temporarily close or have shifted to working from home since the pandemic began, which is great news that institutions have been compliant with the orders passed down from the government. In terms of compliance, 98% reported that visitors have been compliant with guidelines and restrictions while at the facility. However, we did notice that this number distinctly changed from the beginning of the pandemic, where it was much lower, to the end of the pandemic, where following these restrictions and being compliant became much more common. Digital and virtual interpretation methods are some of my favorite part of this research project. So while many were you know, able to increase or begin a digital presence, 37% did report an inability or an unwillingness to adapt or develop virtual programming. 
Some of these barriers include generally the concept of lack, whether that's a lack of employees or the cost associated with hiring, the lack of tech savvy employees, the lack of general funding for operations, technology, ideas, and importantly, the lack of broadband internet access in rural areas of West Virginia produced a great issue for these cultural institutions looking to adapt their information. Some of the forms of digital and virtual interpretation used include Zoom and YouTube lectures, take-home kits provided to students who might otherwise have been able to visit in person, virtual crafting masterclasses, live streams and ask a curator programs, past perfect virtual exhibits, which involve uploading the collection in some form or another to the internet so that they can be viewed for free. In addition to online story maps and an increased social media presence, particularly through such platforms as Facebook. All in all, these have been really innovative ideas and many institutions are every day developing something new and something interesting that they would like to share to the general public and their real or potential visitors. Some of the personal experiences that we identified definitely set apart our study. 11% experienced fear, distress, or concern about their job security due to financial insolvency, and 60% felt that their mental health and well-being suffered under the stress of the pandemic and institutional leadership. We generally can assume that this has to do with the bottom right statistic involved related to workload. 97% reported an increased workload because of efforts to secure funding or adapt programming to the context of the internet. 51% also felt feelings of anxiety, guilt, or non-essentiality. What we mean by non-essentiality is the idea of there's a lot of important and really big things going on in the world, so maybe they're just not worried about museums. That's a very damaging assumption. And unfortunately, it has created a sort of mindset in which people feel that their institution just simply isn't important. However, we know from additional research outside of this study that cultural institutions are a valuable component of healthy and sustainable communities. And they have additional benefits from financial benefits to, you know, just the general livelihood and well being of people. So it's extremely important that these institutions continue to receive support in addition to the professionals themselves who are making those institutions possible. We would like to specifically thank Crystal Weimer, the president of West Virginia Association of Museums, and Danielle Petrak, a board member for the West Virginia Association of Museums, in addition to the other staffers from the association who have been able to support us in our research. Importantly, we would like to thank the West Virginia University Humanities Center for your gracious funding and support of our research. We feel that it's very important and we're looking forward to seeing the future of our findings. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out to a representative of the study. Thank you.